everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our continuing series of uh, seminars from local speakers that are not only new faculty members, but established faculty who get a chance to tell us about the research that's going on in their labs, uh, which they don't often get a chance to do. So it's actually pretty good to revisit these. Um, so today we have Garrett Stanley. I, probably everyone on the call knows Garrett, so he doesn't need a lot of introduction. Um, Garrett is one of the co-directors of the Georgia Tech Neural Engineering, along with uh, Lena, who was our speaker last week. Um, they've, Garrett and Lena have been very instrumental in pushing the momentum for neuroscience and neural uh, across campus and across College of Sciences and College of Engineering. So it's been really, really good to have them uh, at the helm for all of this that has been driving the momentum the last few years. Uh, so Garrett is a, he's an actual engineer, unlike a lot of us. He trained in mechanical engineering, uh, both undergraduate and PhD, and then he did his um, postdoc work in neuroscience, and that's how he got introduced into um, using engineering tools as applied to the nervous system in uh, the lab of Yang Dan at Berkeley, where he studied the visual system. And since then, he has moved on to another sensory system, which he's going to tell us about today in rodents, the somatosensory system, and using that pathway to investigate uh, the basis of neural coding, decoding relation to behavior. So, Garrett, thank you. Take it away. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I, before I shared screen, I just wanted to put my face out there and let you know this is not a recording. Uh, <laughs> I'm re actually really here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share screens. Um, let's see. All right. Well, well, thanks very much. Um, it is really kind of special and fun to speak locally. Um, and and Bilal's right. We don't get a lot of time uh, chances to do that. So, um, you know, I did when I got this slot. Um, I did recognize that it was going to be just post election. So. Uh, I knew that it was either going to be a really great idea or a really terrible idea. Um, people would either be in a rotten mood or maybe a slightly good mood. And, and um, so um, it looks like I, I gambled and probably mostly won. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I also um, wanted to say before I start that, um, you know, during all of the last several months with the pandemic and everything, it's been really tough on everybody. I think. Um, you know, just having this seminar series and, and, and recognition that the community is still together and so on. And Bilal and Simon have done a wonderful job of keeping this going. And it's really been, for those who are new to the, um, you know, the landscape here, you might think that this has just always been the case. But it's, uh, this has been, this seminar series kind of represents the culmination of lots of years with a lot of people working pretty hard to kind of launch this. And so I think we've successfully done that. And, and it's been just a really wonderful uh, thing. And what also is the dream is that people um, from all different areas of research come together and come to a seminar, whether someone's talking about, you know, something at the cellular level or human behavior or whatever. And I think that's important. It's not that easy to establish uh, such a thing. So I think we've done that. And I, I really like the fact that people come every week, regardless of whether it's lined up with their own work. Um, so, um, so again, I just want to recognize the, the, the community, the GT Neuro community and the Neuroengineering Center, and just like all the good stuff that's happening during this craziness. It feels like a little bit of a constant. Um, and then when I started to put the, this talk together, um, I'll tell you it was, it's challenging because you think of all the things you could talk about. And, um, you know, I th thought of, of about 15 different versions of seminars I wanted to give. And ultimately, I settled on um, one that I thought was, you know, um, maybe um, would reach the most people and try to connect. And so I sat down and thought about uh, the goals for a seminar like this. You know, one is... Um, connecting more broadly with people in our community. Uh, you know, it gives me a chance to talk about some of the old stuff that people may not know about, but then connect it to the newer work. That's always a, a good opportunity. Uh, and then, you know, like all the rest of the other PIs that are local, you know, I'm really proud of, of our lab and want to make sure you know who the lab members are and what they're doing. 
And then finally, scientifically, I want to convince you that, that timing is important. And so the title of the talk is Timing Timing's Everything. Um, and, you know, I think time, you know, maybe um, another aspect of this, another angle is that um, everyone I've talked to during the pandemic seems to think that time is doing something slow. Is it going fast? It's a little unclear. And I think we've all been kind of uh, sort of hijacked in that sense. But um, so I, I, I think timing is an appropriate um, thing to talk about. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk uh, about the, some of the work of our lab and um, across a bunch of different relevant timescales and ask the questions about what are the relevant timescales for information processing in the brain, both from a fast millisecond timescale of action potentials and coordinated activity to, um, you know, this kind of medium timescale of seconds to minutes. We study adaptation and other types of, of phenomena that operate on these timescales. Um, and then finally to slower timescales of learning uh, over days to weeks. Um, and the other aspect that Tom has to be aware of is that this is kind of a new assembly of slides, so I have no idea how long it's going to take, but I'll do my best to edit on the fly. Um, so um, this is our laboratory, um, and so we have a, a group of really talented people in the lab that I'm really excited to work with, and it's, I also want to give a shout out to the lab, because during the pandemic, uh, it's been really great to have a group of people to interact with who've helped keep the lab going, the research ramp back up, and so on. Uh, and it's just nice to have that, and I, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the folks in the lab. So um, that's one, one good thing through all of this. Um, so I'm going to start out on the fast time scale, the millisecond time scale. Um, and, you know, a lot of our work really revolves around this. And, you know, and as Bilal alluded to, I'm going to, I'm going to dip back into the archive a little bit and talk about some vision-related work when I first started working in, in neuroscience. Um, and um, so I started working in, in the early visual pathway, became really, really excited and interested in, in studying signal processing. Um, I started studying the early visual pathway and became really excited about just the, the signal processing. You know, I was you know, a total engineer. So as we know, light enters the eye through the lens and, and, fall, and the photons fall in the back of the eye of the retina. And the photoreceptors transduce these, the photons into electrical signals that travel through the layers of the retina, through the optic nerve, uh, to the, a, re, a deep region of the brain called the thalamus, uh, where the, the specific region that, that I worked on was the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN, that then projects to the primary visual cortex. And, um, you know, spent a lot of my time thinking about the spiking activity of neurons in this particular part of the pathway and how that represents different parts of the visual scene, and and at this kind of millisecond time resolution, um, and in particular as it relates to the natural visual environment. That was my me getting my feet wet in the field of neuroscience. Uh, and one of the first things that um, that I then worked on when I started my own lab was um, is captured in this slide. So. As I mentioned, the thalamus is this really strategic part of the of the of the visual pathway and almost all of our sensory pathways, somewhere in between the periphery of our peripheral sensors and the the sensory cortices. Um, and it's not just a simple part of the brain, um, and it's really really complicated from an anatomical and um, cellular perspective. Um, and cells in the the Thalamus actually um, have lots of inputs that are coming not only from the periphery but from other uh, brain regions um, as well as lots of projections that are coming from the cortex back to the thalamus. But one of the things we locked on to early on was the fact that cells in this part of the brain have a particular um, type of channel, the T-type calcium channel, that is normally inactivated. But when um, in inputs come into these cells that inhibit them or, or um, hyperpolarize them or drop the membrane voltage, then, then it deinactivates this mechanism. Uh, so when an excitatory input comes along, there's a burst of action potentials, a very rapid sequence of action potentials riding on top of a calcium wave. And the important thing is that you know, those happen uh, but they induce a really strong impact on the downstream neurons that these, that these cells project to. And in particular, the sensory cortex was our target of, of focus. 
Now, if you, if you Google this or look at it in the literature, most of the time people talk about this in the context of, of sleep and, and slow-wave sleep and uh, generating oscillations in the cortex and so on. And in fact, it's also implicated in um, generating certain types of epileptic behavior. Um, but uh, Francis Crick came along and articulated an interesting hypothesis was that it's not just about that, but potentially it serves a role in gating information flow uh, to um, the, from the periphery to the cortex. Uh, and that's something that really resonated with me, this kind of idea. And it was a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a, a crazy idea. And, and maybe this mechanism that's typically associated with sleep is actually associated with some kind of signaling in the brain. Um, and so we focused on that early on in, in my lab. And in particular, we looked at the um, thalamic activity in the early in the in the thalamus of the anesthetized cat, and this shows uh, that indeed um, this is not just reflective of sleep, but instead um, this shows the response of uh, thalamic neuron to presentation of a natural visual scene where uh, this is from Indiana Jones, where individual frames of a movie, a movie's been presented to the visual pathway of this anesthetized cat. And as the leg moves into the visual field by about frame five or so, between three and five, uh, there's this sudden uh, burst of activity that's highlighted with these red spikes here. Um, and that these are um, putatively or, or suspected to be related to this kind of calcium bursting. And we showed that it was actually at least correlated with detection of change in the visual scene. So it could be very reliably driven by uh, aspects of the visual scene. And we later went on to show that this is um, highly synchronized across the thalamic neuron. Um, and that it, it's really good at detecting change uh, in the environment. Okay, so um, we became really enamored with timing just as a whole and started to dig a little bit more deeply into this. And so specifically, we started to look at um, spiking activity uh, in these thalamic neurons in response to um, both natural movies as well as these, uh, this kind of white noise. So it's a spatial uniform noise, which is this flickering, imagine a flickering um, um, computer monitor that at every frame is changing the, the light level of different grayscales, but it's moving really fast. And what we see and what we saw at that time was that, that the neurons were individually, um, when we look at one neuron across multiple repetitions of this, were really, really precisely locked to the stimulus in this kind of, this kind of noise stimulus. But when we had natural scenes, which were a little bit more um, sort of um, uh, flowing, we see these individual spiking activity was quite a bit more variable across time. So this is time on the horizontal axis. And so we see that it's not as locked to the visual in this natural movie case as it was with the not white noise. And this is work that I started a collaboration uh, with the laboratory of Jose Manuel Alonso in SUNY uh, in the College of Optometry um, and probably in the early 2000s. Uh, and what we found in this work was that um, the when we looked at the time scale, and, there, and there's a lot of details, I'm going to sort of go the route of trying to um, cover some ground here and talk about high level concepts, at least for some of the work. Um, but some fo folks may not be happy with the details I leave out, but the, the, the details are in a paper that's now, you know, 13 years old or whatever. Um, but when we quantified the time scale of the, the visual stimulus versus the time scale of the response, and the details are in the paper, what we found is that the, um, the time scale uh, the, of the stimulus was much longer than that of the response. Or that the, uh, the another way to talk about it is the neurons were much more precise than the time scale of the visual stimulus would, would um, suggest it should be, or at least match to be. So when we looked at this, this ratio between the two, we found that, that on average, the, the response of the neurons were about three to four times more precise than the inputs. When we looked at the natural scenes, uh, you'll notice that it's the same kind of trend when you plot one versus the other, the stimulus time scale versus the response time scale. We see that the stimulus time scale is much longer than the response time scale. They're all, all the points are below the diagonal here. Um, the absolute numbers are much larger over here. 
But, the, but it turns out that the, the proportion of these, the ratio of the time scale of the, of the input to the time scale of the response was the same. So the time scale of the response was again about three times more precise than the time scale of the input. So despite the fact that these neurons get kind of sloppy and they're a little bit, they're significantly less more temporally locked to the stimulus, they, the ratio of the time scale of the input to the time scale of the output was about the same between these two conditions. So we thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and so what we showed in the rest of the paper was that when we considered uh, this from the perspective of being able to reconstruct the visual input from the activity of the neuron, that we found that if the neurons were really, really precise, you could actually reconstruct the visual input really, really well, versus when the neurons were not that precise, then it kind of ends up being sloppy. And so when we quantified that uh, in terms of the information that the neural activity was revealing or encoding about the visual input, we found that the neurons, if the neurons got more and more precise, that indeed the information would go up, that's on plot on the vertical axis here, but that it plateaued at some point and becoming more and more precise did not make, uh, did not the information in terms of this reconstruction. And so this was a very signal processing kind of sampling theory perspective that showed that, um, that there was some kind of potentially underlying uh, rhyme or reason to the timing precision of these individual neurons. And what we found overall, um, well, I should say one more slide before I, I tell you the, the punchline of all of this, was we then looked across neurons that were recorded from simultaneously um, in a pool, so we had multiple electrodes that were uh, implanted into the um, thalamus, again, an anesthetized cat, and we used a bunch of different approaches and a whole range of studies, but we found a similar kind of relationship in that the timing, the timing across neurons was precise. And the relevant time scale here seemed to be on the order of about 10 to 20 milliseconds in the context of natural scenes both in the context of what individual neurons did in their timing precision, uh, as well as across pairs of neurons within the pool of neurons uh, recorded simultaneously. So in response to natural scenes, this 10 to 20 millisecond time range seemed to be the really relevant. So we then started to open up the question a little bit more and say, okay, well, um, you know, what does this really mean? And why do I think timing is really important enough to talk about here? Why am I burning up some of my time talking about this? So you open up any undergraduate textbook and you'll see some figure that looks like this, where it shows um, the sort of concept of spatial and temporal summation. So inputs are coming into a particular neuron here. Um, and these presynaptic neurons, the timing of action potentials in these presynaptic neurons um, matters in terms of what it does to the downstream neuron. So this one shows an individual action potential, you know, has some kind of effect on the downstream postsynaptic neuron with, that slightly depolarizes it. This is an excitatory project uh, uh, synapse. Um, and then when two action potentials occur close together, there's this kind of summation. So there's the first one, and then the second one has an impact. And of course, if you drive it hard enough, you potentially could reach threshold and fire an action potential in the downstream neuron. Similarly, across neurons, we have neuron one, neuron two, the timing of these matters. When they're not close together or not synchronous in time, their impact is kind of uh, diffuse, but when they're coordinated and synchronized across these neurons, the impact um, um, summates. And what's really important here is that it's, you know, it's more than just this simple thing. It's, it's been shown in a number of, of, of uh, really nice studies that in particular, from the thalamus to the cortex, or the LGN to V1 here, this uh, intersection here is really sensitive to the timing of these inputs. Neurons in the, in the cortex and in the brain in general are not really driven by single synaptic inputs, but take the coordinated activity of lots of neurons. It's been estimated that about 50 to 100 sort of primary inputs in this particular part of the brain are responsible for, are, are, are really sort of driving the output of, or driving the activity of these individual uh, cortical neurons. Uh, and this 10 to 15 millisecond integration window is really, really critical. 
So when there's coordinated firing, either rapid succession of active potentials from one neuron or coordinated firing across neurons, this synapse is very, very sensitive to timing, and that's really what gets through here. And it's a very super linear process where it's very, very synergistic in driving the cortex and what the cortex responds to. So I'm making a big deal about this because this is what our visual pathway and other sensory pathways are dealing with. So we opened this problem up and started thinking about pools of neurons. This is a group of neurons recorded simultaneously across, well, actually several clusters of neurons recorded separately, but clusters recorded simultaneously in the LGN in response to this synthesized scene. And you can see this kind of coordinated activity as we move through this kind of video game environment. And we started thinking really carefully about the coordination of activity across pools of neurons and what impact that would have downstream. So, of course, one thing that you might immediately start to think about is the fact that one thing that emerges in going from thalamus to cortex is that of orientation selectivity. So one of the primary emergent features in primary visual cortex and mammalian visual pathway is that of orientation tuning that was discovered by Hubel and Wiesel in their work in the 50s and 60s. And, of course, in this case, neurons in the visual cortex are sensitive to the orientation of bars of light that are presented in the visual scene, receptive field of these neurons. And it's captured here in this kind of conventional tuning curve where the neuron is most sensitive to zero degrees and less so to other angles. But in real life, things are much messier and you get in this kind of polar plots show orientation tuning, for example, at a particular angle. Sometimes it's a little bit broad. Sometimes it's really sharp. And other times you get direction selectivity. So it responds to motion in one direction but not the other. And the proposal from Hubel and Wiesel was that this was wired up. This is just a construct of the anatomy that neurons in the retina and the thalamus, LGN, don't have this property. But the way that the neurons project to the primary visual cortex is how you get this, that there's an alignment of projections across particular axes that give this kind of orientation tuning. And the reason this is important, this feature of the visual pathway, is it was thought at the time to be a precursor to the segmentation of different objects and elements of the scene to give us higher level things like feature detection and object recognition. And it turns out that the anatomy doesn't really support this kind of construct. All of the models that have been constructed about visual orientation tuning have relied on this really sort of extreme constraint of wiring coming from the retina to the thalamus to the cortex. So these are some of the prominent models that we started to look at. And they all rely on this fact, on this idea that the neurons that are giving inputs to the cortex are along this kind of very long axis of projections. But in fact, in reality, it's not really wired up that way. And also, direction, I mean, direction selectivity was proposed to arise from the fact that neurons that are receiving these kinds of inputs, there'd be these long sort of delays that would cause the delay of this input here to arrive at about the same time as the input here, act synergistically on the cell, and going the opposite direction wouldn't cause the same kind of effect. And this is the simple Reichardt detector. But there's really little evidence for this in the mammalian visual pathway. And it's interesting how the field has kind of moved on past this idea. So we took a shot at this. We started to look at the thalamic neurons and the timing of the thalamic activity. And so in particular, we looked at coordinated spiking across individual neurons, two neurons recorded simultaneously that had highly overlapped receptive fields, and simply considered the synchronous activity of these neurons. These are neurons likely project to a common cortical target. And by considering the synchronous activity, you're looking at the activity that's really going to drive the downstream neurons that these neurons are projecting to. 
And so when we plot this kind of polar plot, um, we see that neurons, when you consider the synchronous activity, you can get orientation selectivity out this. Lack of orientation selectivity would just be a circle here. And so elongation along an axis here is orientation selectivity. And what we found is that here's a big glom of neurons recorded from simultaneously in all the pairwise combinations of synchrony and the kind of tuning that we would see. And um, we saw a very, very rich sort of substrate uh, of tuning properties across these kinds of neurons, despite the fact that they're really all on top of each other. And so it's not this, this nice organized thing that we're led to believe in the textbooks. I don't have a lot of time to go into the details of that, but please take a look at this paper if you're, if you're interested in that um, kind of thing. And what we found, sort of punchline here, is that um, we could use this kind of approach to talk about a lot of features of early visual processing, so like orientation tuning, temporal frequency tuning, contrast invariance, and direction selectivity, and this kind of emerged out of this very simple timing argument. Okay, so again, well, maybe I should say that the timing that we considered in that case was on the 10 to 15 millisecond time window to define this level of synchrony. So bringing this fast forward into the uh, more um, recent experiments, um, we've dug a little bit deeper. The tools have changed, and, and we now have the ability to look at little things a little bit. And, oh. Um, and we use, in particular, the vibrissa system of, of the rodent. We've used both rats and mice, and um, I'll kind of present a little bit of each here, but um, the basic idea is that um, this pathway is very, very similar to the visual pathway in terms of the basic anatomy of going from the periphery, um, in, in this case, through the brainstem to the thalamus, in particular a region called the VPM, which is analogous to the LGN, and to the primary somatosensory cortex, in this case called barrel cortex, which is very much like um, V1. And so I'm sure a lot of neuroscientists would be sort of <laughs> uh, rolling over in their graves right now to, to hear um, uh, that, that I'm calling these pathways very similar, but in, from some perspective, uh, they are similar in their processing. And so it turns out that mechanoreceptors in the face around the individual hairs of the whiskers uh, are transduce the mechanical when the whiskers come in contact with some objects, and it signals through the pathway in a very similar way as uh, that I just described in the visual pathway. So um, I won't have time to go into a lot of detail, but more recently, um, a former PhD student, Peter Borden, and the current postdoc, Caleb Wright, um, have been working on um, digging into these kind of um, timing things in um, the, both the thalamus and cortex uh, in mouse using a combination of tools that are sort of bringing, letting us look at this in a lot more detail. So for example, this includes wide field voltage imaging as well as uh, cortical laminar probe recording as well as um, recording in the thalamus and then using um, uh, optogenetics to manipulate the thalamus. And again, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but in this particular case, and this is an awake mouse, head fixed mouse, uh, by hyperpolarizing um, the thalamus with this kind of light input using an LED, and the hyperpolarizing um, uh, um, opsin, halo word opsin, um, we're able to push the thalamus into this kind of burst regime. And so along comes a sensory input, in this case, a whisker input and we can show this kind of bursting activity that I talked about uh, in the first um, few slides. So there's a couple things to note here. One is that the bursting does exist in the awake brain, uh, even in the control condition. Uh, it's reduced compared to what we observed under anesthesia historically, but it's there. Uh, and you can really um, um, sort of turn the knob up on this thing just by providing these kind of hyperpolarizing inputs, this uh, touch on the thalamus to hyperpolarize it. So subsequent uh, sensory input comes along and you get this big burst of activity and you get this boost of signaling at the level of the thalamus. Um, surprisingly, what we see in the cortex when we record downstream with voltage imaging is we see um, an attenuation, a slight attenuation of the cortical response, even though there's a boosting of this thalamic input. And that really sort of surprised us. Um, but what we also see is that there's a spatial sharpening of this. And so it's... Um, this has been normalized, so it has the same peak, but what we see is a much more spatially um, restricted region of cortex that's being activated. 
So um, there's a lot more details to this um, that I don't have time to talk about. But what we think is happening um, is that it's a combination of the level of synchronization that it, that's induced at the level of the thalamus and this precise timing across neurons in the thalamus, uh, as well as the sensitivity um, of the synapses in the cortex and the differential sensitivity across different neuron, neuronal subtypes in the cortex. And this induces uh, a synchronization of the inhibitory neurons in cortex that causes this kind of sharpening. So again, that's kind of a mouthful and probably only for the specialists in this area, um, but something we're really excited about. But this is kind of um, not yet published um, work that we're pretty excited about. So I'm going to end this part um, on the fast time scales just by mentioning that um, you know the downstream downstream brain structures are really sensitive to timing. Um, 10 to 20 milliseconds is is a really relevant time scale that it's not reflecting synaptic integration windows, but more uh, network integration windows that rely on the interaction between excitatory and inhibitory subpopulations of neurons. But think about this: there's a window to get your spikes in, but then the door slams shut. Um, and this seems to be the relevant time scale, 10 to 20 milliseconds. And that this kind of timing provides, uh, this timing mechanism provides this, um, this dynamic gating that we think controls uh, information flow from the periphery to the cortex. And I do want to emphasize it's really not enough just to look at firing rates of neurons. Um, that the timing matters a lot. And so the majority of studies really just tend to look at activity and see an increase in activity or decrease in activity and sort of call it a day. A day. But it's not really enough, actually. And so what makes it through to the next uh, downstream uh, brain structures really has a lot to do with the timing. And this could really be a fundamental principle of signaling. And I also really want to emphasize that revolving through all this work or sort of woven through this is right or wrong some theories about how signaling is happening. So in the tonic burst case, I didn't mention tonic is the non-bursting activity, uh, this kind of um, tonic burst activity to either transmit or detect, uh, detect um, inputs in the sensory field, um, this kind of dynamic regulation of timing, um, the emergence of tuning properties through feed forward wiring and so on. All of these are just theories of how, of what might be happening but are, and might be right, might be wrong, but are important in terms of um, sort of motivating the studies that we conduct. And it's interesting to watch a lot of the field emerge with the technology um, that's enhanced um, and exploding. It feels like we sort of lost a lot of these kind of theories about what might be happening. It seems like we're just collecting a lot of data as a field, but I think it really needs to be framed um, by underlying theories and hypotheses of, of um, how, what we think is actually happening. Uh, and the other thing is that um, what, what I started to notice in the middle of all this work, and it really has been a theme, is like there's often what people believe in the field, what scientists believe, versus what's been proven. And it's kind of interesting to notice what people sort of um, think is true about the nervous system, or maybe this is just true in, in general in life, versus what's actually factual. Um, and so I would just encourage you to keep an eye on that very closely, because a lot of things that people believe in neuroscience and maybe other science is just something that gets repeated, but there's actually, when you dig in, there are not really, um, there's not really evidence for this. And so, for example, you often hear bursting activity is, doesn't really occur, thalamic bursting doesn't really occur in the awake brain and so on, but you're actually really hard to find uh, definitive studies that have actually nailed that down. And I'll give another example of that in a moment. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention before I move on to the next section that we have a couple of projects that are ongoing right now that relate to this, and in particular, Elida Dimwamwa is a, a PhD student in the lab, and she's working on the same circuit but looking very closely at the projections from the cortex back to the thalamus and using a particular transgenic mouse line that lets us target neurons that are specifically projecting from cortex back to thalamus and being able to manipulate those. And we're really excited about this because this is an often overlooked fact that the lar a large majority of inputs coming to the thalamus are actually not from the sensory periphery but coming back from the cortex and we largely just don't know what this does actually as a field. So look forward to, um, to being able to report on that. 
And then Arlie Paula is a postdoc in the lab who's working on um, looking at integration of sensory signals across different sides of the body, in this case, different sides of the face of the whiskers, um, and what impact that the timing has on the gating of information flow in that context. So again, you know, be on the lookout for that. We hope to be reporting on that soon. And then a couple of new members, um, uh, Jacqueline and Adriana are new lab members and are just getting started this year. And Jacqueline is working on uh, a new project that really is about um, looking at dynamics across different spatial and temporal scales using voltage imaging as well as electro recording. Um, and then Adriano is working on closed loop feedback control uh, of neural circuits. It's something we've been working on in the lab in several, for the last several years. Uh, and controlling things on fast time scales. Okay, so I'm going to quickly move on to um, medium time scales. Um, in our lab, we've worked a lot on adaptation and processes that occur on seconds to minutes. And I'll try to move. I'll try to move a little bit faster. I know that I think I'm going to run out of time. Um, a couple of things to say about adaptation. So you know, it's it's a ubiquitous feature of the brain. Um, and we all kind of use that term, right? Colloquially, we talk about things like adapt or die, right? Where human beings are very adaptive, as are all organisms at changing environment, um, and you have to be, right? Um, but that term is used very sort of broadly to describe how you might change in response to a changing environment. Um, and in the brain, it turns out there's many different forms of adaptation um, and many different ways in which the brain actually changes in response to the environment over lots of different time scales. People who, who talk about mechanisms would see these as all very different things, but if you think a lot about function, you might see them as similar kinds of functional, functional things that operate on different time scales, and that's, I probably fall into that camp. Um, but in particular, we've studied a lot ra rapid sensory adaptation. Um, operating on milliseconds to seconds time scales. And so um, if you're interested in this topic in general, we wrote a review article a few years ago on this that, that's pretty exhaustive on it. Um, so be wait, before I show this, I want to say I'm going about to show this. Um, so what is adaptation? I'm going to give you an example of a rapid adaptation. So what I, I want you to do is stare at the middle of this um, uh, spiral. And this is a really interesting version of something called a waterfall illusion that goes way back. So please stare at this and just fixate in the center uh, just for a few seconds. It doesn't take very long. And I'll leave it on for just three or four seconds. If I watch this too much, it really freaks me out. Um, but then I'll turn it off, and if you just stare at the same spot, you'll see it has this kind of lingering after effect, right? And it's really dramatic, and it's, you know, it's um, something that's been studied a lot. Um, it perceptually, this kind of adaptation on very short time scales, we can show lots of different ways. This one in particular is thought to be due to the differential adaptation of neurons in the visual pathway that are coding for different um, types of motion or orientations. Um, but it's, I'd like to argue that this is more than just a parlor trick. It's more than just a trick to impress your friends at cocktail parties, although I have found it's been very useful over the years uh, in various uh, social gatherings. Um, but um, I'd like to argue that it's, that it's something more than that. And, you know, of course, we're not the first people to think about this. And um, a couple of people that I really paid attention to their thoughts and work on, uh, one is Horace Barlow, who actually just died this, uh, this summer, um, who was a longtime champion of talking about adaptation and processes in the brain and giving some reason behind organization function and um, um, this adaptive nature of the brain, the idea that it maximizes information uh, transmission, and it's sort of a how much question, how much information is being transmitted, is somehow um, being regulated uh, by these kinds of processes in the nervous system. And then George von Beckeschi is another um, person who influenced me a lot, uh, did won the Nobel Prize for his work in the cochlea, um, and, and spent a lot of time talking about all sorts of things, right? You go back to some of these old white guys, and they talked about all sorts of things um, and speculated wildly, uh, wildly um, in a lot of their work. And one of the things that really triggered me in, in his work was a discussion about um, the fact that these adaptive processes could be switching and changing what is being encoded. 
So that's something that we really focused on a lot, again, in the context of a vibrissa system. And in particular, we started looking at the fact that when we navigate the world, we detect, we detect things. Did something happen or not? Did something come into my visual scene? Did something touch me or not? Did, did I hear a sound or not? Yes or no? Versus a discrimination. What was it? What was it that I just saw? What was it that I just heard? What was it that I just felt? And so there's kind of this interesting dichotomy, and these two, two things are not necessarily dissociable, but we can study them in, in, uh, um, in we can study them separately. Um, and this has been studied, things like this have been studied a lot in psychophysical literature, but the mechanisms underlying these things have, have been really elusive. Uh, and so I'm going to just quickly mention the study that we did a few years ago, um, where um, it's from Chi Wong, uh, where he recorded from cortical neurons and thalamic neurons in the rat um, somatosensory pathway or tactile pathway using these computer controlled inputs and um, simply asked from, by looking at the neural activity that we record in these different brain regions, could we, in the simple detection task, could we um, determine what was signal versus noise, was something there or not, uh, in the case where he either adapts the pathway with some kind of persistent input or not. Um, similarly, he asked, well, what about if I wanted to discriminate between different inputs? So if I have n different inputs here, in this case, they were just different velocities of whisker deflections on the, on the rat, can I discriminate between these different things in the case where I adapt the pathway versus not? Uh, and what he found was that the adaptation makes the detection worse. So you get worse at saying, yes or no, I felt something. But you get actually better at the ability when you can detect it to be able to discriminate. Was it one, was it stimulus one, two, three, four, or N? Um, and again, there's tons of details here and I, I would love to talk about this endlessly offline, but um, um, one of the things that he did was to say, well, okay, this is, that was in cortex. Where is this coming from? So we recorded from the thalamus also, from the neurons that project directly to the cortex. And um, what we found is that the neurons in the thalamus did not do the same thing. Okay, that's interesting, right? Because they're providing the inputs to this part of the brain. You say, well, okay, maybe it's just going along the pathway here. He found this in when he recorded from these neurons and also importantly when he recorded from neurons that were connected to each other. So we could actually record simultaneously from neurons in the thalamus and neurons in the cortex that were connected to each other, at least with high degree of um, confidence that they're connected to each other. And they just didn't exhibit the same features in the thalamus as with the cortex. So there's a, again a lot of details to this, but what he did find is that the thalamus uh, in response to an adapting stimulus, um, decreased the level of synchronization. So this is just a measure of synchrony. So in response to an adapting stimulus, the neurons would adapt. They did adapt in terms of their overall mean firing rate, but they also desynchronize. And that turned out to be the really key thing. Uh, and it's key because as I told you on some of the first few slides, the cortex is really, really sensitive to the timing across uh, the neurons that, that uh, project to the, these layer four cortical neurons. And so the timing, the relative timings of these matter. So when they become, when they're really, really precise, they're very potent in driving the cortex. And when they become desynchronized, they're less potent. And so there's kind of a, a complicated technical um, uh, argument here. But the idea is that when the system is not adapted, everything is so synchronized that everything goes through and you can't actually tell the difference between any of these different inputs. However, when the neurons become desynchronized, when they're adapted, you, only the really strong inputs are, produce a synchronous response, and the weaker ones are desynchronized, and so they're actually filtered out. So what we found is that this, that this process, and we showed this through modeling, that that was at least sufficient in a model that captured the thalamic activity to the cortical activity to produce this kind of um, effect at the level of cortex. So the desynchronization of these neurons actually produced an increased discriminability in the cortex. So it's kind of cool, so please have a look at that paper if you're interested. We, we also did analogous experiments in um, behavior, and this is work from Doug Olerenshaw, and showed that indeed in a head-fixed rat trained to do a detection task, the adapting stimulus uh, 
when the animal was asked to say, did something or not, did something touch my whisker or not, the animal is, their performance is degraded or decreased, so they can't do it as well with an adapting stimulus. But when they're asked to discriminate between two different whisker inputs, they actually get better. I'm not showing the primary data here, but again, all the details are in this paper. So they get better at discriminating at the expense of detection. So it's this really interesting question about what's being encoded. So we think this is actually a general kind of principle here, maybe same exact kind of inputs, different context. And finally, in this, in this, at this time scale, I just wanted to say that um, Caleb uh, Wright, again, postdoc in the lab, has been doing the experiments in the awake head fixed mouse and showing, first of all, that again, the, cord the, the adaptation is pretty robust. This shows the uh, control case versus uh, when, when these cells have been adapted, it's significantly decreased in their response um, for both the excitatory cells and inhibitory cells of the cortex, and take a look at this bioarchive article if this is your kind of thing. Uh, but almost more importantly, that the thalamic activity, um, that there's, first of all, bursting activity in the thalamic, um, in, the, in the thalamus, in the awake mouse, but that it's attenuated or decreased in this adaptation, and there's a desynchronization of these thalamic neurons with the adaptation. And so, you know, again, there's kind of a long story in the, underneath all of this, but it's consistent with what we observed in all these anesthetized animal experiments. And I don't have time to talk about this, but there's a whole range of controls that he did, did that all of these modern tools are allowing us now to do uh, to really zoom in on the relative roles of these different um, elements of the circuit combined with some modeling, network modeling, that led us to conclude that this um, adaptation is, is that we observe in the cortex is primarily due to adaptation of the synchronous thalamic firing and the way that this synchronous activity differentially engages the cortical network. So it's really, again, all about the timing. Um, so um, I'm going to summarize this a little bit um, that, that we believe that this is, again, a fundamental principle that there's this adaptive gating through this timing. If you're not really looking at this carefully, if you're using big bins and looking at spiking activity over very long windows, you're not going to see it. Um, and we believe that it shapes not only how much information is being transmitted, but the what. And I think the what part is almost more interesting. Um, that different aspects are being actually coded um, depending on the context. And this could be this fundamental principle. And again, you know, this, the, the theories are really guiding us here to think about that it's not just something we observe, but there may be some reason for these things existing. And so I frame this up with, you know, the efficient coding hypothesis or the idea of like that, that how much or what kind of information is being, is being regulated here but with these kind of processes and that, that this adaptive thalamic gating may be sort of the fundamental principle. Uh, and again, I just want to comment on the what people believe versus what's been proven. I guess we had several years of uh, <laughs> information uh, problems in, in life. Um, but um, that it's, it was also the case that was echoed by lots of people that, you know, well, this kind of adaptation stuff just doesn't exist in the awake brain, that all of these anesthetized studies didn't really represent what's happening. But yet the experiments really have, have, hadn't been done for this. And so it's kind of interesting, again, that I found that a lot of scientists would kind of echo these things when you couldn't actually identify papers that showed that. So we just went in and did them and showed that it's actually indeed the case. Uh, I just want to link to a current lab member. Um, Yi uh, Liu is a, a PhD student in the lab, and she's been working on ways of uh, techniques to record simultaneously across brain structures with large-scale recording approaches and identifying connected uh, neurons when, when, when possible. And so this is, um, this is something she's been working on. And this is an onion because I like to think about this as kind of peeling the onion. We think that there are multiple adaptive processes that may be happening. Uh, not just the sort of rapid things, but maybe at multiple time scales and that, that kind of get obscured and we're working on sort of peeling the onion of this kind of adaptation right now. Okay, so um, finally, I just want to quickly um, mention this last little bit, very quickly, um, and go on a, this slower time scale of, of learning. 
And let's see, did I? Okay, hang on. So I, you know, one of the things that we're we're interested in, and I think anyone who studies the brain is interested in certainly sensory processing, is that you know obviously behavior is the most important thing, and that for sensory systems we think about perception, and it's really kind of an invasive thing. Like, where is it? Where is perception? And it's generally assumed that it emerges somewhere at the cortex, uh, but pinning it down is really tough. And there's just a ton of old literature with all sorts of techniques like lesioning or inactivation protocols um, that report all sorts of different stuff, right? And it's confusing. If you grab, if you get your head around all this literature, you will find it's really, really uh, confusing and sometimes contradictory. Um, and there's recent literature that has really questioned whether cortex is necessary for simple sensory tasks. Um, and this would seemingly contradict lots of old, older literatures. And I think what's, what I would say, and people in our lab would think, is that um, the role of these different brain regions is really dynamic. And it may be that what the reason this literature is really confusing is that, um, that maybe the role of different brain regions is not really some static fixed thing, but it may be changing depending on complexity of tasks or changing over time. And I just wanted to quickly uh, go over this last couple of slides. This is work from Chris Weiblinger, um, who's a postdoc in the lab. Um, welcome back, Chris, from Germany, being banished for several months. Um, so, um, so what he did is trained uh, head-fixed mice, uh, but also did voltage imaging uh, in the superficial layers of cortex while the mice were doing this kind of tasks. This just shows the expression of this genetically engineered voltage indicator called Jevy, uh, Jevy which is particularly arc light in this case, when the animals were trained to do a simple go, no go detection task. So a whisker stimulus is delivered, and if they lick the water spout they correctly, then they get a reward. Uh, if they impulsively lick, they, they can have a false alarm. Um, if they miss the stimulus, it's a miss, okay? And what Chris, we published on this something on the basic paradigm, the behavior in 2019, but I'm gonna talk about some more recent stuff here. And I'm gonna emphasize looking at different time scales, the early during training, the amateur level versus experienced. And I'm gonna to try to do this quickly, sorry. Sorry, Chris, I won't be able to do this justice. Um, but what he looked at is across sessions um, of training, multiple weeks here, that the animal just gets better and better and better at this task. This purple line here is the hit rate. So how well can they do it? You know, how well do they get a hit? Uh, versus the false alarm rate starts, um, it, it, it really kind of stays pretty constant, right? The false alarm rate does not grow. Um, now, interestingly, when he looked at the cortex, it's pretty constant across this. This is just the voltage imaging in response to an individual whisker deflection. And so despite the fact that the neuronal activity shows this kind of growth in performance, this D prime measurement, the neuronal activity is pretty flat. Okay, so not much happening early. Okay, naive animals being trained up. Nothing happening in S1. Okay, it just seems like a static thing. However, he showed in his previous paper and more recently in the head fixed mouse that when the animal was challenged with uh, either with a stimulus, in this case drawn from a random distrib a, a statistical distribution, so in this case velocity of different inputs from a high range versus a low range, so in one case the animal is trained, uh, trained to detect inputs from this, this is the psychometric function, the probability of response or the hit, hit rate as a function of the strength of the input. Of course, stronger input, they're better at it. But when they, are train, when they switch to this low range condition, uh, the animal actually improves their performance. And so notice that some of the stimuli are exactly the same, uh, so there's overlap. So this eight degree or four degree, they're both part of these stimulus set, um, but they're in a different context. And so what we found, and again, there's not time to, to show this, um, is that the animal seems to be changing their behavior to maintain reward or reward expectation. So he showed this beautifully in the 2019 paper and more recently in this uh, paper we're, we're finishing up, uh, that they changed their behavior um, in a way as to um, maintain the reward in the face of this changing stimulus statistics. And it's reversible. So if he changes back, they change back. Okay, so when he looks at the experienced animal, what he sees is that the voltage imaging shows that the same exact input, this eight degree stimulus, uh, is stronger 
in this low range condition when the when the task is harder ok and that's pretty interesting right to same exact stimulus on a particular trial there's just a stronger response in the cortex to this particular input and shown summarized here for the time series of this voltage uh, uh, signal um, so what we did then was we looked at the relationship here's the psychometric function and here's what's demonstrated at the level of cortex the amplitude of the, of the input versus the voltage imaging at the level of cortex as a function of the amplitude. And this explains some of the behavior, but not all of it. And so when you actually attach a second function here that represents what's happening downstream of primary somatosensory cortex, together these two functions um, are constrained to represent the um, psychometric function, which is overall the strength of the input to the behavior of the animal. So when we do this, what it gives is the ability to fit different parts of things to different data sets. And what he showed is that the high range condition uh, is fit with this kind of function versus the low range. So there's some kind of shift in this. Um, however, it doesn't completely explain uh, the behavior. And so the downstream neurons, whatever is receiving inputs from primary somatosensory cortex, is actually doing the rest of the work. Okay, again, I'm, I can tell I'm not doing this justice. I'm making it too fast. But I want to give the punchline here, which is that um, it turns out that early in training, in the amateur phase, um, that a large majority of what's happening and what explains the behavior is captured by the downstream neurons, whereas only a little bit of it is happening in S1. But when he looks later at the more experienced animal, a larger percentage of the uh, explanatory power lies in S1. So this is something that emerges later in the animal's training. So if you were not aware of this and you're looking at this thing at different time frames, you might actually conclude different things. And so that ties into my overall sort of um, thought that, that time scale matters a lot. And it suggests this higher level, high level decision, decision making could be pushed upstream or earlier in the sensory motor arc. And we have some, that's a typo there, we have some additional evidence that we see cognitive decision-making signals as early as the thalamus. So it doesn't really get at causality, but there's a, and there's a ton of work to do, but it's super exciting for us. Uh, so again, when you look is critical. So last slide, you know, again, my goal was to try to sort of throw in something for the community and let you know the kinds of things we're working on and tie the old stuff to the new stuff and make sure you know who our lab is and, and in case you see them wandering around the halls. And I've hopefully convinced you that the timing matters a lot um, at all scales. The key that is that everything is dynamic and adaptive and that the theories are really important in sort of guiding us in this kind of technology or, or technique phase of neuroscience. So again, I'd like to thank my lab and I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Garrett. One minute to spare. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, 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 it was a brand new sort of talk, so I jammed it. I know I jammed some stuff in. Yeah, maybe we, uh, maybe we limit it to one question so people don't have to kind of hang around. So there was a question in the chat from uh, Tim Cope. Tim, are you still here? Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, great talk, Garrett. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I'm wondering why you're excluding um, integration at a synaptic level. Uh, in the 20 millisecond time scale. You know, IPSPs can be tens of milliseconds long, and you wouldn't necessarily need a network explanation for that time scale, it, it seems to me. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, maybe that's me just with knee-jerk reaction because we, you know, I, I agree. I think, it's, I think it's probably a combination of the synaptic properties as well as, you know, the, the excitatory inhibitory interactions, you know, the feed forward inhibit, the, the disynaptic inhibition at the level of the cortex. It's just that others in the field have kind of had this response that, well, wait, how can it possibly be on the order of 10 to 15 milliseconds when synapses are only integrating over a couple of milliseconds? But I agree with you in that I don't even think even the synapses are that simple, right? I think that these prolonged uh, inhibitory inputs can, can actually um, have long-lasting effects on it. And so I don't think the 10 to 15 milliseconds is maybe unique to the network. I, I agree. 
maybe I maybe overstated that almost as a knee jerk reaction to the community. No, that's okay. And thanks for recognizing that because people are now uh, in auditory cortex and cerebellum in spinal cord are recognizing that inhibitory synapses are maybe misnamed. Um, they do have the op they do have the effect of suppressing um, neural activity if they are um, if there's temporal dispersion. When they're synchronized, they act le they act more as a clock than they do as a suppressor of activity. So anyway, oh, that's great. Okay, well I'd love I'd love to talk with you more uh, offline about that. It sounds uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, thanks. And again, just um, I know Bilal's going to cut me off, but I'm happy to, you know, my main job is just trying to tell you about our lab. I'm happy to talk um, with anyone who's interested in any of these pieces of it um, offline. Okay, maybe that's a good point to transition if people need to go. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out to, to Garrett or any of the local speakers, as I mentioned last time, to follow up on. Uh, interactions that we can have in, in our virtual world these days. So thanks, Garrett, for the tour of your kind of overview of how you got where you got. That was very interesting. Yeah, th and that. thanks to you and Simon for, you know, keeping the seminar series going and doing such a great job during all of this craziness. It's something. <laughs> all right. Thanks. All. Thank you.